So now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Bill Bernyeet, Manager of Programming at Canadian Planetariums. Bill is joining us from Vancouver, British Columbia, and has provided planetarium programs across Canada from Vancouver Island all the way to Newfoundland. So welcome, Bill. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Julie. It's great to be here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad to, uh, for having so many people. You know, <clears throat> I think at some point, everyone has wanted to be an astronomer, even if it was just for five minutes. You go outside, you look up at the nighttime sky, and you see a bright object there, and you wonder, is that a star? Is that a planet? Will it be there tomorrow night? Or, or will it be gone forever? Or what can I see tomorrow night or the next night? All these things have easy answers to them. But the first thing to do is to sort of get ourselves oriented to the whole project of astronomy. And that is by looking at the celestial sphere. Here it is right here. This ball, I call the celestial sphere. It's a big globe and it's supposed to have the stars on the outside of it. So the stars sit on the outside and in the middle is the earth. So if I just pull it apart here, you, you might notice that it's, it's really a colander, right? <laughs> so, and there's the earth right there. So the earth sits in the middle of a big imaginary ball called the celestial sphere. And the earth is turning, of course, but we don't see the earth turning. So in other words, it seems to be immobile and the big ball turns around in exactly the same way that the earth rotates, but in an opposite direction. That's what we see in the nighttime sky. So um, the sky seems to be moving around and turning around and around. This has been the experience of people for thousands of years and early people uh, were adept at uh, finding out what was uh, above them and putting on a, uh, some sort of map of the stars. Let's see what one of them, if we um, choose a map, choose the right one, we can see a sort of representation of this in the sky, right? So here is the, uh, celestial sphere in a little different format, right? So we can see now we have the earth is in the middle and the stars are all around. The stars are in groups called constellations, right? So stars have names just like we have names and they're in constellations. Now, how do we make sense of this practically? A good way to do this is to uh, begin by using a planisphere. A planisphere is a disc that has the stars mounted on it, right? They're like, like that. There's two parts to it. There's part number one, the star map, and then the template that it goes into. So one slides into the other, right? And then we can choose any day of any year, right? And rotate it to the time of night. So we match the current date, right? We're in, in August. So we can match the current date with a time, and then the map will show us the stars of the nighttime sky. So it, it's um, held up high up over our heads, right? M making sure the north, west, east, and south are uh, where they're supposed to be. And then you can see the map of the sky. As the time progresses and it gets later, the whole thing turns around, just like I was turning the celestial sphere earlier, and we see different stars. Right. right now in the summertime, the bright stars um, Arcturus, uh, Vega, Deneb, and Altair are visible in the nighttime sky. And these bright stars are um, useful in finding other objects. For example, you go to a, an observatory and uh, look at what they're doing, you'll be, maybe be surprised that they're not looking at a bright star, they're looking at something else. So I do that as well. I find Arcturus, which is a bright star, and then drop down a little bit, find a couple of other stars that set me in a path going to a star cluster. So last night I was looking at the star cluster M3, right, which is a large globular ball of stars, and I could see them quite well in my binoculars, even from uh, Vancouver, where I was doing the observing from. Um, to do stargazing, it's a good idea to find a spot um, that is uh, free of uh, city lights and free of automobile lights and things like that. So find a place, maybe a park, maybe if you're um, um, in an area which is verging on the countryside, your backyard will be fine. Right, or some place where you can look around and there aren't many obstructions and, uh, and lit buildings and things like that. So smaller communities have more of these areas than larger areas. So 
it's easier to do stargazing from a smaller community than it would be from downtown Toronto, where there's lots of uh, lights going on all the time. Okay, so once we've got our star map, then you can go outside, orient it, and then find out the names of some of the bright stars in the sky. They might say, well, where do I get one of these things? A good way to find a planisphere is to go to the website of the National Research Council of Canada, the, the NRC, is a government body and on its website, there is a uh, printout for a planisphere kind of like this. So you can print it out then with your scissors, cut out the circle, cut out the other template, making sure you cut out this part, right? You don't have that filled in. And then you will have your own planisphere, begin your study of the nighttime sky, right? So it's um, as easy as that, just going to the, National Research Council website, right? Dial the proper or click on the proper link and then print out your own planisphere. Sometimes you can get them also at camera stores and places like that. But um, it's more difficult to, uh, uh, to, to find uh, these types of things at like a uh, local grocery store or something like that. They don't usually carry planispheres. You have to go to a specialty store. Okay, so you've got your planisphere, you're outside. Uh, the first thing you notice is some of the stars above you. The stars aren't all the same. Some stars are sort of, um, well, a little bit colored. They're sort of orangey or yellow or pink or red. Um, they come in all different colors, in fact, all the colors of the rainbow. There's even stars that seem to be kind of purplish, right? Now, the colors of the stars sometimes form combinations which look quite attractive. Like you'll have a yellow star and then a blue star right beside it. Or another favorite combination is a red star with a little green star right beside it. These colored combinations um, are aesthetically quite wonderful to look at, but they also tell us something. The colors of the stars tell us the temperatures the stars are at. So blue stars are hotter and red stars are cooler, right? So I know that seems sort of backwards to some people. You think, hey, wait a minute, red hot, that should be a hot and blue, we associate blue with cold, right? I'm so blue, boo hoo hoo, right? But actually that's backwards to how things operate in nature. On an oven, right, that, that may be true, but in, uh, in things in, in nature, which are heated very violently, right? Blue stars are the hot ones and being blue hot, is hot and red hot is a little bit cooler. So um, we can put the stars on a sort of a continuum based on their colors, right? Knowing the temperatures at which um, the colors indicate. Once we know the temperature of a star, then we can do other things such as find out pressure and volume. Um, in other words, the size of the star, right? Based on things like the ideal gas equation, which is a, a mathematical equation that expresses a relationship between pressures and volumes and temperatures of gases. And as stars are gases, well, that's clear because they obey these rules for gases. So the stars are not like um, a pumpkin up in the sky or a watermelon or something like that, or a piece of metal that's heated. The stars are made out of gas, right? And they get more and more compressed towards the center where the densities would be very great. And in the middle, it is so hot that um, nuclear fusion occurs and a lot of energy is given out. And this is why the star glows. The sun does the same thing. The sun is just a regular star. And uh, but for a long time, it was kind of a puzzle. People wondered, how is it that the sun glows year after year after year uh, without apparently running out of heat? Because if the sun were like a giant drop of gasoline and was set on fire, it would burn up in a few thousand years, right? If the sun were a lump of coal and were ignited, it would um, only last about 50,000 years. Now, this wasn't a problem um, in the early 19th century because no one had any idea how old the Earth was anyway. So uh, for all anyone knew, this could have been the case. The, the Earth could have been only, uh, and the cosmos, only a few thousand years old. But then uh, some experiments were done which showed that if the Earth were to be a, a hot ball, it would take a very long amount of time for it to cool down. So the earth must be many millions of years old. Also, the fossil record was discovered and fossils indicate that life forms had been on the earth for a long time. And there are many of them that are no longer here. So in other words, the earth must be 
very, very old in order to accommodate this. This brought back the question, well, how the heck does the sun shine, given that it has to shine every day for a very, very long time, maybe millions and millions of years? Well, no one had a very good explanation for this. There were a few guesses. Someone guessed that maybe the sun contracts, right? And as it contracts, friction, like when you rub your hands together, they get hot. Friction inside the sun as it contracted resulted in the sun getting hotter and hotter and giving off light. But the flaw in that plan was, of course, the sun would contract and get smaller and smaller and smaller until it wouldn't be there anymore. So that didn't seem to be very good. There wasn't many uh, better ideas until the uh, beginning of the 20th century when it was found um, that um, molecules and, and atoms could fall apart in a process called radioactivity. So radioactivity is the key to what goes on inside the sun. It means that the sun can consume huge amounts of material, but very efficiently, giving off light and heat and energy for a long, long, long time, even billions of years. And this is the case with the sun and the stars in the sky. So this is why they glow uh, without any faltering or failing. Um, their uh, light is uh, 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 unfailingly there, right? And they're not going to run out uh, of energy anytime soon because of nuclear processes in the center. Well, um, the things that are small, like the earth, um, or the moon or things like that don't have these processes going on inside. Only things that are very, very um, large can take part in that. But we can find out something about the moon, which is always a, a favorite. Um, the moon and shooting stars are easy to observe. We'll hear more about shooting stars. On the disc, you'll see there's a yellow line that goes around it. That yellow line is the solar system as seen from the point of view of outside the solar system. So the planets go round and around on this disk, the moon as well going through its phases. Right now, the moon is um, approaching a uh, new moon, so you won't see it at night. It won't uh, rise until very, very early in the morning. But when the moon is up, um, it's a, a target of interest. You can uh, take a look at the moon. Um, I often look at it in my binoculars. I go outside and uh, um, so have a look at the moon and see what it's doing. The moon looks something like this. And it has two types of surface. It's got these lighter area and then these darker areas. The patches on the moon uh, make shapes. This is the dog on the moon. There's the head of the dog and the body of the dog and the front legs of the dog and the dog's tail is right there with that ball on the end. So this dog must obviously be a poodle dog, a poodle dog on the moon. Over here, the man on the moon. There's his head and his body and his legs right there. He's carrying a backpack or something on his back. Okay, so the darker areas um, on the moon were originally called the maria, which means sea or ocean. But of course, there's no water there. It's all dust. It's just that there's darker dust in the uh, dog and the man on the moon place. <clears throat> now, if you go online, you can easily find um, pictures of the moon. Right? I mean, there's no shortage of pictures of the moon. Everyone with a camera is taking pictures of the moon. But if you really want to know the moon and experience it sort of more intimately than a, a photograph, of which there are just so many. In fact, I, I think there should really be uh, an effort made to discourage photography. It's, we've just gone overboard with it. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that won't go anywhere. Anyway, um, what I suggest is you make a drawing of the moon. And this is how it's done. This is how we begin with a uh, clipboard right, and some drawing paper. And then the little circle is how the moon appears just to the unaided eye. The bigger circle is how it appears in a pair of binoculars. Right? So the first thing we do is we draw in the dog on the moon and the man on the moon. So there's the moon there. And I'll give it the other one to, by comparison. Here we are here. So there's our photograph. Whoop, I've got it upside down here. There's our photograph and there's a drawing. So I've just penciled in the man on the moon and the dog on the moon. That's the first step. Now though we know that the interior of those areas will be darker. So the next step is to darken them in. So there they are there. So I've darkened them in. And then the next step after that 
is to indicate with little numbers areas that will be left white and then areas that will be not as dark as the Maria, but a little bit lighter than not the Maria. So in other words, in between, they're marked with little numbers, ones and twos, which are on the picture. So then the final result, this is um, a picture of the moon made with a 30 power telescope. All right, so here it is here, we can see the moon. It's a little bit tilted over here. And notice that there's little dots on the side. These are craters. The moon wasn't quite full, so I captured some craters along here. Craters all have names, right? So we can find out what crater we're looking at. Right? And then above it, I chose this nice tree. What I did was uh, went outside, sketched the tree in, and uh, from an angle where I knew the moon would be that night. And then in the nighttime, I came up with a clipboard and made a drawing of the moon with the tree above it. So it's sort of aesthetically pleasing. Uh, I've got another one coming up because I wanted to capture a half moon. So I've got a circle. The circle is made with a, uh, a jam jar. You put the jam jar down on the paper and draw its outline. There you go, you got a moon. <laughs> and there's a tree below it that is outside in our garden. And I'm going to sketch the half moon just above the tree, which I haven't uh, yet finished up. So that's a way, that's a way to tackle the moon. Um, <laughs> the, um, if you do a drawing of the moon or any other object in the sky, you, you really know it. Whereas a photograph is sort of, it comes at you and it doesn't have any meaning really. You probably notice that um, in social media that you encounter many things that don't have any context. There's something that just is there what it means or what it's for, no one has any idea, except the advertiser who secretly paid for it to be there. <laughs> well, anyway, my point is that the drawings of the moon and the, and the planets, if you have a bigger telescope, give you a real insight into what these things are really like, rather than a sort of a shorthand version that, that's uh, given to you uh, by photography. That being said, some people have said, uh, you know, take an issue with this saying, oh, Bill, you know, <clears throat> it's just that you're not a very good photographer. So that's why you're saying draw, not take pictures, because so many other people are very good at taking astro pictures, but I'm not in that club because I don't have a $6,000 camera. Well, how about this? Here's a picture I took. This is uh, Jupiter's moons. There's a little bit of sheen here, but I think you can see there's a little, there's some dots right over here. And these dots are the moons of Jupiter. Now the white disc is Jupiter itself, but it was overexposed because this was a one second exposure well, on a, a film camera. So to capture the moons of Jupiter, I had to overexpose, but I caught those moons as well. The little moons go around and around. How can you see that? Well, <clears throat> binoculars or a little telescope is fine. However, anyone can enjoy these things without much expense or hassle. <clears throat> For example, here is over here a... Okay, this is the eyepiece of a pair of binoculars. Now, where's the other piece? Oh, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> well, someone at my house sat on a pair of binoculars and broke them. And we know who it is, too. He says he didn't do that. But I know better because... They were in perfectly good shape until he was in the same room with them. And then they fell on the ground and I, I saw that he was sitting on them, but he says he didn't. Okay, fine, whatever. <clears throat> but here they are. This is the objective lens. So this is uh, what looks out. This is the eyepiece where you put your eye. So you look here there, and there they are. So that there they are minus the part that goes in the middle. Right? That's what you get when you have a, a broken pair of binoculars. Luckily, the lenses are all in good shape. They weren't harmed. Now, a telescope is just a tube that holds those things static so that they don't move around. So going to this hardware store, to the <clears throat> plumbing department, I got this, um, this tube, right? Now, I measured this tube. It's eight inches or about 20 centimeters long. 
right? And the reason I chose that length was <clears throat> that taking the objective lens outside and holding it up to the sun, I formed a little image of the sun at that distance, right? So that's called the focal length of the telescope. So this lens has a focal length of about eight inches, right? That's where the image is formed. So I chose a tube that's eight inches long. It's mounted in here. When the thing is working, it's glued in here, but I have it disassembled so I can talk about it. Now the eyepiece goes at the other end, eight inches away, as we've seen. And again, <clears throat> this is a stop down from the plumbing department. In it goes. And eyepiece. Now we have <clears throat> a seven power telescope. So if you look through this, um, things will look seven times closer than they are or seven times bigger. Right? So now it's true <clears throat> that if, you know things aren't perfect. It makes things look upside down. That's how things naturally look if you observe things through a, a, a pair of lenses. Right? Things will be upside down. But for the stars or the moon, that doesn't matter. Right? In binoculars, they put prisms inside to reverse the image and flip it over, so you have a view of things right side up. But here, uh, we uh, because we're sort of uh, well quick and dirty, right? We're uh, skipping that. I'm just going with this. So this gives you a little bit of power when you do your observations. You can see many stars, especially the colors of stars, they're not visible otherwise. So the little homemade telescope, this tube um, was, uh, they sell them in the store, so it's like uh, $12 a foot, right? So, I mean, it wasn't, didn't break anyone's budget to make a little telescope. All right. If you have a pair of binoculars, that's fine. Then you don't need to uh, have Bear come over to your house and sit on them and then uh, you know, if they're already good working order, then that you got a, a leg up. Sometimes people um, can find a pair of binoculars. You may not um, have thought about it, but if you look in the back of your drawer of a drawer or something like that, or the back of a cabinet where you hardly ever go, you might find things there like an old pair of binoculars. And um, if you do, press them into service because um, they are they're pretty good for for the stars, and and in some ways um, take the place of a powerful telescope. Well, <clears throat> so the um, planets go around the sky um, in the same way the stars do. This summer, there'll be two planets visible in the nighttime sky. One's very bright and the other one is medium bright. And they are in the direction of south and a little bit towards the east. Now, I'm imagining that I'm standing in town um, on the lake shore and I'm looking towards the United States, right? And if you can imagine that, right? So your back is to Canada and your front is pointing towards the US. Now on your left-hand side is the East. And in the East rising up, you'll see two dots. One very bright, that's the planet Jupiter. That's this one here, right? And the other one that's to the right of it, but not very far to the right, is the planet Saturn, the planet with a ring around it. So they can be seen um, with uh, a telescope, a pair of binoculars or a little telescope shows the moons of, uh, of Jupiter. The ring of Saturn is a little bit tougher, but if you have a spotter scope, if you're a bird watcher and you have a spotter scope, um, you can see the ring of Saturn uh, in a spotter scope with about 20 or 25 power. Now, I've done this just to make sure that I'm, what I'm telling you is correct, right? Because someone was saying that Sometimes the things I say are not correct. Right? So I better check up on all these things, eh? Yeah. Okay, so you get your spotter scope and um, turn it to the planets and you can see them uh, coming up. They'll come up um, earlier and earlier as the summer progresses. And then by the fall, they'll be up uh, relatively high, but still well in the Southern part of the sky. They never get overhead. Right from Canada. If, if you saw the planets overhead, you would uh, pro you'd probably be located somewhere south of the, the Tropic of Cancer, right? So, um, and you'd be in South America or something. So uh, from where we live, uh, the planets maintain themselves at least where they are now uh, in a relatively Southern part of the sky. In the future, in the winter, they will be higher up, but we have to wait a few years for them to migrate around. Well, <clears throat> I guess the big event that's coming up now and uh, might be of, uh, of uh, paramount interest is the, uh, the Perseid meteor shower. Now, sometimes when I mention that, 
um, I notice that people get sort of mixed up about a few concepts. So sometimes there are words which seem to be similar, but which are not, um, like astronomy and astrology. Those two words seem to be similar, but they're not the same at all, right? Astronomy is a science like physics or chemistry, whereas um, astrology is a fortune telling based on the positions of stars, right? So now another two words that get mixed up are meteor, comet. A comet, here's a, here's a comet right here. Yeah, so well, there's a comet. So a comet uh, is an object in the solar system that's going around and around the sun, right? It takes months or weeks at least to move slowly through the sky and uh, get going around the stars. So that's a comet. A shooting star is not like that. A shooting star is in the Earth's atmosphere, zips through the sky and burns up. Sometimes pieces of them can be retrieved, which I have one, I'm sure. Oh, here we are, right here. The, yeah, the bear was hiding it. That's why it didn't show up immediately. Um, this here is um, a rock from space, right? So it's a part of a shooting star. So this object, right, was up and going around and around the sun in a little orbit. The Earth came by and it zipped into the Earth's atmosphere and then burned up in a, you know, Bit of light this chunk was left over fell on the ground and was picked up and retrieved so if you could hold this in your hand you might be a bit surprised because it's very heavy it's like a lump of metal right and in fact made out of iron and nickel when the earth was formed it had lots of iron and nickel and that iron and nickel fell to the center let's get my uh my mini earth here there oh there we are there's the earth so this heavy stuff, iron and nickel, fell to the center of the earth, right? And in it went, which meant that the middle of the earth is quite dense and massive, right? Because it collected all the stuff that fell into the center. So the earth is very heavy. If we made a cement ball exactly the same size as the earth, the earth would be much, much heavier than the cement ball. Now the moon, didn't get very much of this heavy quarter the size of the earth there's about their size of uh, ratio of sizes right yet it, astonishingly the earth is 81 times heavier than the moon not uh, not just a little bit uh, heavier but about 81 times so there's the um um there's a little consequence of these rocks from space uh, coming at coming at us from all angles. So this, uh, this uh, Perseid meteors, these uh, shooting stars will be racing through the sky and it can be seen. Now, the best way to observe them is to um, go outside and sit outside in a deck chair or a lawn chair or something like that, where you can see the whole sky around you. Telescopes or binoculars aren't of any help here because they only look at a little tiny bit of the sky at one time. They have what's called a narrow field of view. So if we um, uh, dispense with the telescopes and just go and sit outside and look up into the sky from a reclining position, then watching the sky, you'll be able to see lots of uh, shooting stars, right? So around and around they go. Uh, so the shooting stars appear to come from the direction of the constellation Perseus, right, which is rising up high in the northeast part of the sky. Right? So north and east, that's where the shooting stars appear to come from. But it's not really true that they're coming from that place. It's a perspective uh, that gives us this idea that they're they're rumbling at us from one place in the sky. It's kind of like the um, illusion of um, uh, railway tracks. If you look down the railway track, the railway tracks appear to come together in the distance. So if you look down the tracks a couple of miles, they seem to be joining together. I know somebody I knew, um, and he uh, phoned the uh, CN and said that uh, there's going to be a, a train derailment because the tracks go to a point in the end. He was looking a few miles down. Of course, they didn't pay any attention to him. Um, so um, this is the same thing with the shooting stars. They come in a kind of a um, like a like a flock of birds flying at us. Right? And every August 12th, the Earth in its orbit is in such a position that it will go around and around and encounter this mass of little rocks. So some of the rocks will come down to the Earth, fall down, and then 
then you've got uh, a meteor shower. So these things are not unique uh, to August. They happen all the year round, but the August ones, the Perseid meteors on the 12th of August, they are perhaps the uh, best known of all these, uh, uh, all these uh, meteor showers. There's another one in July called the South Delta Aquarians. Um, and they, they are not quite as strong as the Perseids. There's others, the Geminids happen in December. However, at least in Canada, the weather is usually poor in December. So we don't see very many of them because it's raining or snowing or something like that is happening. So um, they're not as well known. Um, so the summertime seems to be the best time for shooting star watching because of the fact that um, the, the temperatures are, are more balmy and we don't have to put on multiple coats to go outside. Now, sometimes, and uh, this, this has been done, the um, um, people watching the shooting stars are organized into teams. And what they do is they sit outside with a planisphere and when they shoot, see the shooting star, they mark the position of it in the sky. Now, if two people who are separated from a great distance on the surface of the you know what, the earth, if two people see the same shooting star and they're located in different areas, right, the shooting star will appear to be in a different part of the sky. Right? And that different part of the sky when plotted um, can be found out the true path of the shooting star in the sky by something called trigonometry. And I bet you th thought that trigonometry wasn't useful for anything. Well, it is. It's useful for finding out where shooting stars are going. So two people find out where this, uh, the shooting star is going, and then its trajectory downward to the ground can be calculated sometimes. And then what you do is an observatory will uh, send uh, a team to that area to look around, see if they can find any fragments of the rock from space. There was a famous one that happened in where I live in, in uh, Vancouver in about 1988, as I recall. And um, the uh, shooting star was seen very, very bright. Uh, it lit up the whole ground around, uh, around where we were. We were at an observatory. And uh, the whole ground was lit up like daylight for a second as the shooting star zipped through the, the sky. So we noted its position and there were quite a few reports. Um, and so it was hoped that maybe some of the fragments would be found, but as luck would have it, um, the, the rock went sailing right over Vancouver Island and into the Pacific Ocean where um, uh, it, there was no way to find it. It fell in deep water, of course. Well, um, hopefully uh, we have better luck. There's another way of having good luck, and that is to go to some place where the shooting star, when the rock emerges, right, will be visible just on the ground. And there is one such place, Antarctica. So in Antarctica, if you walk around, you're standing on a sheet of, um, of, of snow, perhaps a kilometer deep. Right? And so therefore, anything that is sitting on the ground must have come from space. Right? And so teams have gone there and collected uh, large amounts of, um, of rocks that have come from the sky for analysis. And we find out that a lot of them are like the iron nickel meteorites that I was uh, mentioning. But there's another class of them. They're called carbonaceous crondites. They're a, um, a, um, a term you don't want to hear if you're uh, in a spelling bee and are asked to spell that. But anyway, the carbonaceous crondites are um, sort of uh, very light pumice-like, and they are similar in some ways to some rocks that have been found uh, elsewhere in the solar system um, or in, in asteroids and things like that. It was thought when the <clears throat> um, trips to the moon were being organized, um, it was there were two theories. One was that the moon was would be like the Earth, but only smaller and simpler. The other theory was that the moon would be like the um, carbonaceous crondites, right, and it would be uh, similar to meteors. So when the rocks came back from the moon and these were examined, it was found both theories were false, that the moon is different in, in many, many ways. So while there have been a lot of speculation about the origin of the moon, we really don't know uh, where the moon came from. Um, it must have, uh, it's been going around the earth for a long time, at least uh, around four and a half billion years, but its origin is still a mystery. And the theories to explain where the moon came from are just that. They're not really well grounded. They're just the least 
um, uh, fallacious of the various theories that have been uh, have been uh, circulated. Well, if you look at the moon in the telescope, you'll see it's got these round things on it, craters. Everyone has heard of craters on the moon. Yeah, they're quite interesting to look at. Even in a small telescope, reveals huge numbers of them. The moon was bashed and whacked over time, and uh, these these features have been left. When a rock hits the surface of the moon, it leaves a circular depression. Uh, this depression is, um, is, is always in a round uh, shape, right? Um, hardly ever elliptical or some other shape, it's usually round. The craters on the moon <clears throat> have not arrived on the moon just um, uh, like one at a time over long periods of time. No, most of them got there in a big rush about 3.8 billion years ago in something called the major bombardment period. So the major bombardment period meant that there were just rocks falling every which way on the moon, whacking it all the time at that time. The solar system was fairly new, right? And it, um, it got, there was a lot of extra stuff in it. So these extra stuff went around and around and then whacked each other. And then after that, everything seemed to settle down until we have pretty well the solar system we're familiar with now. But this, this sort of um, <clears throat> uh, beginning um, of the solar system where it was sort of like forming itself into itself, there was a lot of stuff kind of like uh, was thrown away, sort of like, uh, like peeling corn. And you know, when you peel a corn, you throw away the, uh, uh, the stuff the corn comes in. Right? And, uh, and there's lots of that. And I, I have, sometimes have to go twice to the uh, recycling to put, put it in the garbage. <clears throat> well, the craters then were made basically at that time and very little has happened on the moon since then. So during this process, however, when the um, moon was being whacked, there was a lot of heat accumulated inside the moon, right? So the moon started to get hot inside. And when that happened, the moon burst in a few places and then material from inside the moon came out and flowed along the surface of the moon kind of like molasses. And this molasses like flow was darker than the original surface of the moon. So the dog on the moon and the man on the moon, they were made in this process. And if you look with a telescope at the dark areas, there are fewer craters per unit area on these darker areas than in the bright areas. Right, because the, the darker areas are newer. So at one time, the moon would have been uniformly like that, right, with no dark areas. But then the dark areas came, flowed around, and uh, now we, we have what we what we have. Right. So <clears throat> at one time, it was thought that we might be able to, um, using a computer, uh, go back in time to reverse the course of the moon in its orbit and go back and back and back, right? And find out the initial conditions where the moon and the earth met and were formed as, as, a, as two bodies. Um, and after all, computers like uh, desktop, uh, publish, uh, des desktop uh, computers can simulate the stars and predict what's going to happen ahead of time. So we can see what the moon is, where the moon is going to be a month from now, a, a week from now, 20 years from now. Right? So we can, by cranking the numbers, find out where the moon is. But could we go back four and a half billion years right, and find out the initial conditions where the moon started to go around? The sun, uh, at one time, it was thought, once the computers get bigger and faster, the answer will be yes. But then it was found out that this is not really possible, even in principle, uh, no matter how fast the computers are, because there's enough... Uh, small disturbances, right, in the initial conditions and enough uniqueness that we can't really extrapolate into the future from, from a, a ground zero. So in other words, as we go back in time, uh, things get murkier with errors that cannot be erased, right? Every scientific me measurement has an error to it. And that doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that there's a limitation to our knowledge because we too are parts of the universe. We're not outside it looking down like, like from a, a throne up in the air, right? We are part of the universe too. So our limitations as physical objects means that all of our measurements are going to be slightly flawed and slightly in error. Now this doesn't necessarily mean disaster. As long as we have a good idea of how large the errors are, 
right? The error in the distance to the moon is very, very small, probably less than a few centimeters. But the distance to a, a distant galaxy, where we might say it's like 10 million light years away, that measurement is, uh, is probably plus or minus 30% which would be a few million light years. So in other words, the further away the object is, the more our knowledge is partial, imperfect, and um, uh, based more and more on speculation uh, and less and less on, on hard facts. And of course, the uh, cosmology, the science of the entire universe, is the, has the least number of hard facts uh, going for it. There's another type of thing, and that is a constellation, like the Big Dipper. Is the Big Dipper a thing in nature, like a flower or a rock? No. It's, it's made by people, right? And um, I was talking once to a, um, uh, to a trapper, First Nations trapper, and he could tell the time at night by the Big Dipper. But when I discussed the Dipper in detail, turned out uh, that this trapper only recognized six of the stars. The last star in the handle of the Big Dipper, he didn't need that one, so he didn't recognize it. But we, rec or at least in a Western culture, we recognize seven stars in the Big Dipper simply because seven is a special number. We have the seven sisters, the seven uh, daughters of Atlas that are also stars in the Pleiades. So in other words, the constellations and all these things are culturally specific and are not things in the environment that would exist if we didn't exist. Right? So, and the odd thing is that because we make up all these things, we can know everything about them. But the things that we don't make up, which are found in nature, much of that will remain always mysterious. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our planisphere. We've got um, our... Uh, August 12th is down on our, our notebook, or everyone's hoping to uh, write it down. So look for the shooting stars. And while you're not seeing shooting stars, um, take a look to the south over, over uh, Lake Ontario, and you'll see the two dots, Jupiter and Saturn. Remember, Saturn is the fainter one to the right. Jupiter, the very, very bright one um, that, uh, that rises a little bit later. So... With your planisphere, and I see that um, uh, Julie has uh, kindly put up the, uh, the click for the uh, uh, planisphere for the National Research Council. And uh, so everyone should take advantage of that and make, uh, make a planisphere. When, um, before the pandemic, I used to visit schools. And one of the things we would do was take uh, these templates and the uh, kids would cut them out, glue them, on the back of file folders and then the kids would all make a planisphere and then we'd practice uh, finding uh, the Big Dipper and things like that. But since um, it's not been possible for me to visit uh, very many locations, um, I have taken to the Zoom and um, therefore this is the funny, re you know, it's, it's odd that I'm talking to you from Vancouver um, and, uh, and and you're in, in Ajax in, in Southern Ontario. So um, the Hopefully, though, we can do this again. And um, in, the, in the fall and the winter, there are other things that come up. The constellation Orion rises up. And the constellation Orion has three stars in a belt and uh, star myths to go with him and many other things as well. So perhaps we'll be able to uh, check in again and learn more about backyard astronomy. The bottom line is everyone can be an astronomer. It's not like nuclear physics or something like that, where you need a huge equipment. Um, you don't need a, uh, you know, a grant from NASA or a pilot's license or anything like that. Anyone with a planisphere um, can go outside. If you have a pair of field glasses that you use for birding, take them with you and uh, begin learning the constellations. And the constellations don't change, right? So they'll always be with you if you learn them. And it's never too late to make a start on, on the constellations. Okay, well, uh, that's um, that's about all I've I've got to say. So I guess uh, is Julia there? I'll, I can turn the program back to her for any concluding remarks. Julia, are you uh, are you with us? Yes, <laughs> I'm still here. Okay. Um, thank you so right. much, Bill. That was great. Um, I just like to open it up. If there were any questions from our <laughs> audience, um, you can feel free to put them in the chat or to unmute yourself. Um, I'm going to stop the recording so you can feel free to put your camera back on if you wish to do so.